left is uh, Stephen Hayward. He's currently senior resident at the Institute of Governmental Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, among other academic posts, he was the inaugural visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy here at CU Boulder from 2013 to 2014. Uh, Stephen, as with the other two panelists, uh, there's a, uh, a fuller uh, uh, biography that you can read in, uh, in your program, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat what's in the <coughs> program. Uh, the next uh, uh, panelist is Elizabeth Eastman, uh, formerly professor of liberal studies at California State University formerly a professor of political science and history at Chapman University and Azusa Pacific University in Santa Fe. And then at the end of this table is Ian Milheiser, who's a legal scholar and currently a, con a columnist for Think Progress. I will not uh, indicate what the uh, political persuasions of any of the three panelists are. I think that will uh, reveal itself as we proceed. Uh, so we will turn to the panelists' opening statements, and we're going to go <coughs> in order, Stephen, Elizabeth, and Ian. Okay, well, thank you, Albert. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I want to try and set up the discussion in the following way. Uh, I have a dislike of cliches and terms that get overused and become too commonplace because I think they actually lose their utility uh, and are unhelpful. And so, for example, uh, I do a lot of work on social science, and I never use the word normative. And I scandalize <laughs> social science by refusing to use the word normative. I, you know, it's kind of funny, but I, and there's a whole bunch of other academic terms that I refuse to use. Uh, some of them are popular in the lingo these days, like performativity. I understand the underlying theory of it and so forth, but it, you know, I don't think it really works. And so with identity politics, uh, the term now is just comes with all kinds of baggage and barnacles and becomes something that stops conversation instead of starting one. And so you know, the title of this panel is The Era of Identity Politics, but I want, so, I mean, the main point I want to make is that there's sort of two ways or two phases of this. I'm going to say we've had identity politics in the country in a sort of common sense way from the very beginning. Uh, but that it has taken a step change in the last couple of decades. I'll try to walk through why. When I say we've always had it, we've always had uh, controversies about you know, ethnicity uh, and you know, who gets to be an American and how and why and so forth. You know, in the 19th century, you have a know-nothing party, controversies about immigration, dislike of Catholics, Irish, uh, uh, Eastern European immigrants, right, the Chinese, out in California and elsewhere. And then, of course, you have Teddy Roosevelt arguing vigorously that we shouldn't have hyphenated Americans, right? Uh, by the way, I'm one of those oddball conservatives who much prefers Franklin Roosevelt to Teddy Roosevelt. I actually think Franklin Roosevelt, in some important ways, was to the right of Teddy Roosevelt. And by the way, Ian, I've had some fun conversations with a couple of your colleagues on this point, um, <coughs> uh, Rui and uh, John Hoffer, we'll right? We'll have so a lot to chat about afterwards. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, you think about uh, sort of the way politics was practiced in sort of some of the big urban cities where you had the melting pot, a phrase, by the way, that at UCLA, they tell you you shouldn't say. You shouldn't say the phrase. There's official guides that put out to students, not Berkeley. We're way better than UCLA. They put out, students shouldn't say America's a great melting pot. That's now a dubious proposition. Uh, but you know, back in the old days of Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, places like that, uh, back when you had the political system where you just punched one lever for straight ticket voting, the parties would get together, and you know, New York, you don't want an Irishman, a Puerto Rican, an Italian, uh, a black, a Jewish person, uh, you know, sort of a Catholic, and you know, all that. that's a balanced ticket, <laughs> right? No, I mean, it's, and and well, and it worked pretty well. Democrats have always been better at it. it. Goes back to their Tammany Hall days, where they really reformed a very skillful service of integrating immigrants in the big cities, and that become part of the political machine and so forth. Thing is, the old um, political machines, urban machines, died in the 1960s or were murdered. That's a long, tangled story we could talk about. Uh, and what's taken its place now is a, the, okay, the new visage of identity politics, which is much more politicized, much more ideological, uh, and I think much more problematic and makes all of our racial and ethnic divisions worse. They're already difficult enough. This is making it worse. Now, um, I can go through lots of parts of this. I'll just give you some news of the last couple of days. Here's President Obama two or three days ago in Germany. One of the things I do worry about sometimes among progressives in the United States 
is a certain kind of rigidity where we say, I'm sorry, this is how it's going to be, and then we start sometimes creating what's called a circular firing squad, where if you start shooting at your allies <laughs> because one of them has strayed from purity on the issues, what do they have in mind? Maybe he has in mind this story from CNBC two days ago. I'll read you the headline. Rising Democratic presidential can contender Pete Buttigieg said, all lives matter in 2015, putting his record on race in the spotlight. So four years ago, he said the wrong thing, burn the heretic. <laughs> and that's only the beginning. Uh, there have been a whole bunch of um, stories about, by the way, he's an interesting guy, right? And this is bothering some people on the left, oddly enough. So here's the headline from Slate. Is Pete Buttigieg just another white male or does his gayness count as diversity? <laughs> and there's been a lot of online chatter about this. Well, you know, we're not sure he's gay enough or if that counts enough. And one of the lines in the Slate story, quote, <coughs> most of the time gender and race are way heavier burdens than sexual orientation in the professional and political environment. So he doesn't check off enough boxes. You know, as a white male, even though he's gay, he's already minus one. So you've got to get some others that's not quite matching up to it. Or the other one that's got me right now uh, sort of astounded. Uh, so here's the headline from Oprah magazine. Pretty big circulation magazine, right? You've heard of Oprah. Uh, Will Smith may play Serena Williams' dad in a new biopic, and it's stirring up controversy. You know what the controversy is? Huge traffic on social media, several articles in the press elsewhere. He's not black enough. Now what, is, is the reaction is as if the studio had said, we're gonna cast the governor of Virginia in blackface for the role, right? I mean, I do get it. If, if David Lean were here today remaking Lawrence of Arabia, uh, he wouldn't cast, uh, what's his name, uh, Alec Guinness as King Faisal, that's pretty dodgy. We wouldn't cast Yul Brenner anymore as the King of Siam. Uh, we wouldn't, maybe not cast Charlton Heston as Ben-Hur. But are we really gonna start using melanin swatches to cast people in movies? Are we gonna say to Edward James Olmos, no, you're actually not quite the right hue to play Jaime Escalante, a movie role he played 30 years ago? This is madness, it seems to me. Um, let's see, I've already run overtime. I have three or four, of course. I'll just put it this way. Uh, those are some of my opening thoughts. And to paraphrase Marx, Groucho Marx, if you don't like those, I have others. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Eastman, and it's my first visit here to Colorado, and I'm, I'm delighted to have received the invitation. Uh, you know, the title of this t panel is the area of identity politics, and before we determine, you know, take, take the phrase, the ways that our religious race, religion, race, ethnic, and social backgrounds influence the way we think about politics, I think there's a prior question. And for me, that prior question is this, what is the purpose of identifying groups or assigning persons to groups? And I think we can identify some good reasons and some bad reasons. And to me, the good reasons are, first of all, we have a natural tendency as human beings um, to associate with like or that which is similar. And then in addition to that, I think groups foster fellowship. They can provide a, for a deeper understanding because there's a debate or there's a conversation or there's a, you know, a, an activity that we can join in to um, kind of uh, you know, discern what, what do we believe and I think also within the political arena, we can join together as groups and act to advance policies and such. But on the flip side, the bad purpose is, I think the phrase group think highlights uh, the shortcomings or the dangers. And one can go along with the group think without even thinking through the position or issue. They just make assumptions. Oh, I'm, I have this color skin, so I'm with that group. Another problem is not distinguishing the individual person within a group who may disagree. And this leads to my next issue. We'll return to the good and bad purposes in just a minute. My question is, is who decides the group think? And I think this is one of our most troublesome things that we need to, to get our heads around. Is there debate among the group members uh, about their beliefs or practices or policies or policies that they wish to advance? And what if one chooses not to be a part of a group, even though there may be similarities in skin color or ethnicities or religions or sexual practices? Now, let me take an example from uh, colonial origins in America. I teach both political science and history, and I've, I've, I really enjoy teaching colonial um, America. Those who came from England were born into a station in life, and they were subject to a king, and some were born into an aristocracy, and others were born into a life of servitude in varying degrees. So when speaking about identity politics, do we simply change the term, substitute king, aristocracy, and servitude, 
for religion, race, ethnicity, social background, and the like in colonial America, and that we must submit from birth to these categories. So I, again, it brings me back to my question, who decides the group think? So I think the answer to this question will help to determine whether the purpose of assigning people to groups is good or bad, and help us to understand some of the current controversies surrounding um, our politics today, and especially our identity politics. Many of the recent examples of identity or group politics have been negative. Uh, rather than serving to unify and bring those together who share common characteristics together for the good purpose that I mentioned above, I fear the opposite is happening. Those who challenge the position of a group are ostracized and publicly demeaned. And I'll give you three examples. Uh, first of all, the LGBT community, the coupling of, of lesbians and gays and bisexuals and transgenders, I think they may have initially come together to group those who wanted to advance uh, dramatic social change. Okay, that's a good reason for bringing a group together. But recent events have shown some, well, fraying, to put it mildly. Uh, current debates surrounding the Equality Act have lesbians challenging uh, transgenders, specifically asking the question, should those born male, but now call themselves female, be able to compete against those who were born female and remain female? And you know, you can find several articles that are, that are advancing this. A related example is um, a recent conference, lesbians and feminists were complaining that their voices were not allowed to be heard. So who, who put the conference together? The Conservative Heritage Foundation invited all of these, uh, or several of the uh, lesbians and feminists to say, we want to hear your voices. These are truly important issues. That's my first example. Second example has to do with um, African Americans. What happens when all black Americans do not wish to embrace a progressive or liberal agenda, uh, but are instead conservatives? We have black conservatives such as Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams. They're a stark contrast to Jesse Jackson, Barack Obama, and Al Sharpton. So who decides what African Americans think or should think? And then my third example actually comes from my religion. I'm, I'm a Catholic. And our former Pope, John Paul II, lived under a communist regime and advanced a church teaching that stood as a challenge to them. Whereas today, our Pope, uh, Pope Francis, advances a teaching that's sympathetic to socialism. So what's a Catholic to do? <laughs> yeah, believe you me, I spent a lot of time thinking about this um, issue. <laughs> I'll keep thinking about it, I'll pray. That's what I'll do. <laughs> Can't always pray, that's what I'll, it's a Catholic backdrop. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, you know, these three issues I think highlight one of the issues, you know, what we're facing today and why this question is so important for us. So uh, I'm, again, over my time, so I'll leave that. I've got more to say perhaps at the end. Thank you. Could I just interrupt here for a book? I'm sorry, applaud. <laughs> Thank you. I never like to step on applause. Uh, I am not getting any questions uh, on the app, so uh, our Q&A session is, uh, are going to be uh, uh, brief unless uh, if you want to use a note card, uh, raise your hand and one of the uh, uh, producers will uh, give you a pencil and a note card and uh, we'll get some questions. Um, okay, Ian? All right. So we got a panel called The Era of Identity Politics <coughs> and when I was asked to speak on this panel, my immediate thought was as opposed to what other era? <laughs> like, I mean, like, so, you know, just, just to take a brief trip through American history, so, like, the first 80 years or so of American history were defined by slavery, which was white people imposing unnatural legal burdens of people be on others because of their skin color. We fought a civil war over this. There was this thing called Reconstruction where we decided maybe we'll treat black people as humans for a while, and then we decided, now nah, we're not going to do that. And so the next 80 years of American history were defined by black codes and peonage and Jim Crow. The Civil Rights Movement, which, do, you know, <laughs> which dominated much of our conversation in the 1960s, was about African Americans saying, we do not want these burdens that white people have put on us anymore. And so that was very much an, an era of identity politics, which, also, which was succeeded by the Nixonian backlash and the Southern strategy, which caused a realignment of our political parties, which still dominates our politics to that day, to this day. And, and, uh, you know, and I could talk about other racial groups that have who, uh, who have 
been at the locus of, a, of our identity-focused politics. You know, in the, the first exclusionary immigration law passed by the United States was the Page Act of 1875, which effectively excluded all Chinese women from entering the, from entering the United States due to some very, very sexist and racist um, stereotypes about Chinese women. Seven years later, they passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which does exactly what you think it does. And then about 40 years after that, they passed something called the Johnson-Reed Act, which, and I'm not making this up, was written by the Ku Klux Klan. Our, like our immigration policy for about 40 years was set by the Ku Klux Klan. The way that it worked is we had, we had quotas where you looked back to, I think, 1890 and to the population makeup of the nation of 1890, and we would only admit immigrants to match the population makeup in 1890. Why do you think the Klan wanted to do that? Because they were trying to preserve a certain racial identity and a dominance of that racial identity in, in the United States. You know, we could talk about gender. The first law, the first state law in the United States permitting um, women, or at least permitting married women to own property was passed in 1890, and it was a Mississippi law that had nothing to do with, equ with, with equality. It had to do with allowing men to hide their property from their creditors by giving it to, the, by giving it to their wives. As late as 1887, a third of U.S. states did not allow married women to, open pro to control their own finances or to own property. Um, and while we eventually fixed that problem, there was another much more sacred and personal issue that we did not fix for a very long time. The first successful prosecution of a man for raping his wife did not occur until the 1970s. So for most of American history, women were the financial chattel of their husbands, and they were the sexual chattel of their husbands. And that was the identity politics that was foisted upon them. Um, if you were gay, between, in just three years, between 1947 and 1950, 400 federal employees were forced to leave their jobs because they were, because they were gay. Uh, three years later, Eisenhower signed an executive order requiring, this is a quote from the executive order, federal contractors to ferret out and discharge their homosexual employees or risk losing, um, their, their, con or risk, risk losing their contracts. Um, individual federal agencies were allowed to discriminate against gay, against gay employees until 1998. And of course the military didn't allow gay people to serve openly until 2011. And they didn't get, the, and we didn't have marriage equality in this country until 2015. So it seems to me that every era has been the era of identity politics. It has been the, it has been a story of primarily straight white men deciding what roles they want to foist upon people with other identities, and then using their dominance of the political system to force those identities upon them, with occasional periods where those groups said, enough of this. And the only difference I see between this era is than in any other era, I see, I, see, I see two differences. One is that I think that we are now seeing a mass movement where the groups that have been on the receiving end of this treatment are saying, enough of this. We're not gonna do this anymore, and we finally have the political power that our demands are gonna be heard. And I guess the second thing I will say about this is that this entire process is going to be awkward. You know, it's, it's, going, it's going to be difficult. We are dealing with questions that we have struggled with for our nation's entire history. We're not gonna get it right. It's gonna be a process of experimentation to figure out how to get it right. And like any process of experimentation, people are gonna come up with bad ideas. And you're not gonna get to a solution unless you're willing to experiment with things that don't work. But I think that one thing that is different about this era is that we've, we've been engaging in, exper in these kinds of experiments for our entire history. But for most of our history, the burden of what happens when you don't get it exactly right has, been, has fallen consistently on the, on the backs of people of color, has fallen consistently on the backs of women, and has fallen consistently on the backs of gender and sexual minorities. And the only thing that I think is different now is that we're saying some of the time, maybe some of the burden should fall on white people. 
<laughs> okay, we have a uh, period of time where uh, uh, the panelists can respond uh, to uh, the other panelists, uh, taking five plus minutes, uh, Stephen. Yeah, so, uh, so good on you, Ian. That was good and spirited. Um, <laughs> so on the other hand, though, um, so I'm going to use my, uh, you know, white males, in other words, terms that sort of overused. So I refer to myself now as a pale penis person. <laughs> That's the alternative. And uh, so you listen to all these things, and nobody disputes that history. It may have been undertold. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but how did anything change? I mean, if we're all such awful, if we pale penis people are so awful, why did we ever take our thumb off of anybody? How did that happen? Were we just asleep at a switch? Uh, I'll say, say a little bit about sort of the general narrative you gave um, and try to bring a, reset things a little bit. Um, about 20 years ago, I had the great honor to meet some of the, uh, you know, World War II veterans who'd been in some of the Japanese prison camps in Burma, some of the ones who built the railways. And so I said, oh, you know, bridge on the River Kwai. And what I learned was every single one of them hated that movie. Think about why did they hate that movie? Think about it for a minute. It was this romanticized uh, account that, you know, heroism and it, you know, although there's a little bit of depiction of, you know, violence and unpleasantness, they said, are you kidding? It's this joke. Movie's a joke. They, you know, they walk out of it, they hate it, right? So now, I do think it is quite correct for uh, you know minorities, pe people at Howard. You know, Howard Zinn talked about. I want to write the, the perspective of history from the losers, people who lost out. I think it's quite reasonable to say that the standard account of American history that I grew up with, which is only just the good stuff, is insufficient, incomplete. I think that's completely correct. And getting that story told is an important reason why we did make. The sort of the liberal reform tradition continued to have all the reform, and, but where are we now? What are the actual obstacles and barriers now? So I'm way into the social science literature right now, especially on racial disparities. And what I find is this general conversation, the way it's been set up, and the way Ian gave you know, a version of it, is totally disconnected with wrestling with what explains disparities in, in employment discrimination which turn out from some of the you know, field studies that have been done, make you scratch your head. A police interaction, I'll give you one quick example. Uh, there was a big study two, three years ago of the Oakland Police Department done by some people at Stanford. And what they did was they downloaded, I think, 15,000 hours of body cam footage and then stripped out the audio of interactions of police on traffic stops in Oakland, you know, heavily black town. And so what do you suppose they found? And then they coded the language. It's very, very rigorous and very elaborate. They coded the language, and what they found was yeah, interactions with black motorists by the police were uniformly more hostile, less formal, just, you know, unpleasant. So, straight up racism? Well, the authors of the study said, no, actually we don't think that, here's why. First of all, <laughs> go for the data, no difference in those interactions between white officers and black officers. Well, there's all these recondite theories about why black officers and police are caught up in the culture of oppression. Okay, we can have that theoretical discussion if you want. Then the other one that, ought, that raised their eyebrows was they found that all those racial distinctions disappeared when they coded people by age. So you pulled over older people, white or black, and suddenly the police officers were more friendly, more polite, and they said, we can't explain this. You know, this is where you see you know, there's a normative, you know, anyone with common sense can explain it. You walk up to a car, it's been driving slowly, is it somebody looking for a drug dealer, is it somebody, you know, not, you know intoxicated, whatever, and you pull over, it's just some old guy. And the policeman, they have common sense, says, oh, okay, you're an old guy, just be careful, or maybe I gotta, you know, who knows, right? Um, and so the point is, it's not so simple. And of course, the other thing they say is they didn't code the language used by the people they pulled over. I talked to a person in the mayor's office about that, very sensitive subject about that, I totally understand all that. But the problem is, if you just want to reduce this to, oh, it's this old matrix of the oppressive white guys and black, that we're not getting anywhere on that kind of problem. And I can double down on the employment problem all day long of two if you want. Okay. Well, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't step on applause. I, I, I know, you're right, you're right, my problem. Uh, so I guess um, Ian, the predominant, um, you know, the thrust of Ian's um, examples tended to, become tended to come from governmental actions. Mm. And I, 
you know, I, I guess when I think about identity politics, it's not so much about um, governmental actions, but I, you know, my focus tended to be on the people. You know, you, you know, my example from birth, are you placed because of your colors, you know, the skin of your color, blah, blah, blah. Put, uh, you're put into a particular group, and I think that's one of our biggest challenges today. You know, we have remedies for that. You know, we have courts who can offer remedies. We have uh, legislators who can offer remedies. We have um, interest groups who can form and push back on some of these, you know, I'll, I'll freely admit, many injustices. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess I, I want, for, for my purposes, the, the discussion of identity politics to come back to um, the people, and you know, once again, going back to my question, you know, who who decides? And I think, and you know, I'll throw in another variable. You know, this um, our in our era of social media, where um, I gave one example is what happens when one is you know assigned to a group because of you know certain external factors, and that person wants to dissent. I mean, we have a wonderful history of dissent within our country, and it takes many forms. But with social media and what I, you know, pretty much refer to as bullying, I mean, you know, the, the quashing of the voice or, you know, Twitter, you know, doing their shadow banning or, you know, hate speech, you know, who determines what hate speech is and, you know, uh, you know entire websites or people just being pre prevented from voicing any opinion. So, you know, is my opinion of hate speech the same as Steve's or the same as Ian's? Well, you know, that's where I want the debate. And, you know, I'd rather have this speech out there so that we have the freedom to say, no, that is wrong or that's unjust or we have to enact a policy or we have to come together and make sure that, that that's not advanced. <coughs> so that's why I guess my, my tendency to, uh, when we discuss identity politics, is in fact to discuss, uh, you know, the people, the citizenry, and, you know, have the freedom to come together, have the freedom to dissent. So I'll stop for now. <coughs> <clears throat> so I want to start by asking you to imagine a foot race. We'll say there's two, two men in this race. That we'll make it simple. The names are Bob and Tom. And the race is about to start. And right before the race starts, I walk up to Bob, and I punch him in the gut, and I kick him over, and I put my foot on his neck. And then the race starts, and Tom takes off running, and after some period of time, you know, maybe 10 years, or maybe 10 minutes, maybe you know, 400 years, I, just, I decide to take my foot off of Bob's neck and let him go run the race. Now, I tell you what, Bob isn't winning that race. And the reason why Bob isn't winning the race is because it's not a remedy to what I did to Bob to, for me to simply take my foot off of his neck. And you know, you, you, you mentioned that a lot of the a, lo a lot of the examples I gave are governmental examples. There's a reason for that, because for many years in this country, the way that politics was wielded is people who had control of government used the sovereign authority of the institution has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force to put its foot on the neck of certain people, and you can't just remove that foot and expect them to catch up right away. You know, we, we, we heard about this study involving um, police officers and their treatment of young, uh, of young people who are pulled over. I have a pretty good idea why young black men were probably treated very poorly by cops. <coughs> some of it is racism, but some of it I suspect is that young black men are disproportionately likely to be poor. It's because young black men are desperately are, 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 are desperately more likely to be less educated, and poor people and less and less educated people are not going to be treated as well by the cops. They aren't going to have the social stature. They aren't necessarily going to, you know, they're, they're going to give us unconscious signs that, that that show their lack of social stature. And it's not because there's anything about being black that inherently makes you poor. It's because they, their ancestors had a foot on their neck for their entire lives. And when your parents are allowed to develop, and your grandparents are allowed to, do, to develop familial wealth over the course of many generations, they pass that wealth on to you. They pass on those opportunities to you. When your parents are educated, you are more likely to be educated. And if the state has been systematically denying you an access, access to that education, your children are less likely to get it. 
even if the state has taken its foot off your neck. So yeah, I, I mean, you can, you can come up with explanations independent of race or independent of gender or independent of sexuality for why we see disparities in this country, but it does not change the fact that we have the lingering effects of a process of using our politics, you know, again, using the only entity that has a, the legitimate right to use force, to use that force in order to keep other people down, that's not going to go away just because you stop doing it. It's a good first step. <laughs> well, can I, mean, I, for heaven's sake, I, mean, can I do a, a question? Ahead, yeah. a so, uh, by the way, it, I, I mean, this is a compliment. It may not sound like it. Mm -hmm. It was a good restatement of Lyndon Johnson's Howard University speech, which I thought was good. I, I, you put it more, a little more colorfully, but, uh, but a speech, that, that part of that speech, as you may know, was written for him by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who got nothing but grief for his underlying analysis about it. My question, though, is, is this. Um, at what, what are the measures of success? What, what is the point we can say, or how do we, you know, See, I'm, I'm having trouble forming the question. The point is, is that, look, not all white people are equal, right? I mean, what's the measure that we've made sufficient progress beyond just changing the law? What, because there are always going to be disparities. There are disparities among white people. That was Lincoln's great comment about the Declaration in the, his Dred Scott speech, right? Is, you know, we couldn't even make all white people equal, right? Uh, so w what are the milestones that you right. suggest for us? Right. That, so, I'll put it that way. Yeah, so I, I, I don't <laughs> think that the goal of society should be complete equality amongst all citizens. There's going to be some people who have more money than other people, and that's you know, how, how things have to operate. But when you have a society where the average white family has in the neighborhood of $100,000 worth of wealth, and the average black family has, depending on which data you look at, somewhere between a negative net, net worth and about $8,000, you aren't there. And, 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 you know, and you don't have to necessarily know where the finish line is to be able to look at where we are now and know that we are so far from the finish line that we need to keep running. Uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I accept your premise that, like, there will come a point where we could say, all right, like, you know, there, there may come a point where we say, all right, like, th th this is not a problem that we need to, uh, you know, apply as much attention to as, as, as we historically have. But we're nowhere near there. And I, I don't think we can ask the question of what the finish line looks like when we're so far away from it. We, we, can, we can barely see it off in the distance. No, no, we can, I mean, I don't know when you want to. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. I'll, I want to uh, kind of uh, conflate uh, uh, two or three uh, comments that uh, um, I've, or questions that I've gotten and uh, <coughs> uh, confess to a, a confusion of my own, uh, which has been somewhat exacerbated actually by uh, uh, some of the, the comments that uh, you guys have made. Um, this is a panel on the era of identity politics. Um, there's something different about what's going on now. The term identity politics was not used until the mid-1970s. It has not been around for a long time. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, Ian and, and uh, uh, Stephen, too, have pointed to the fact that uh, uh, groups have always organized uh, 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 the Irish in Boston in uh, you know the 19th century uh, you know on and on and on and there have always been grievances um, but somehow or other uh, I think that we uh, we've got a term now it's identity politics uh, we didn't have that before before we had grievances uh, and uh, 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 people dealt with them however they dealt with them, but now we have identity politics, and uh, what's different? Uh, and I'll make one uh, uh, observation. Uh, uh, Ian referred to the civil rights movement uh, 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 back in the uh, uh, 50s and the 60s. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, African Americans, particularly in the South, were uh, uh, mightily oppressed uh, back then, uh, and they did uh, 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 gather amongst themselves in their churches, and they organized, and uh, 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 you had uh, uh, a group uh, 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 action uh, uh, being taken, and yet you had Martin Luther King in his famous uh, speech, uh, uh, I think transcended uh, uh, group politics by saying, I have a dream, and the dream is that uh, little white children and little back black children will, uh, will come together. And I think what's happened, uh, to some extent anyway, with the focus on group politics and grievance after grievance after grievance, and the grievances are justified, is that uh, what group politics or, or identity politics can too easily lose sight of is what the ultimate goal is. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ian, do you want to come, or Stephen? Uh, or actually, you know, I'll, I'll okay, say, sure. say, go say, for it. Yeah, yeah, I'll go for it. And because th this will allow me to, to <laughs> conclude the, my original set of remarks. <laughs> <laughs> See, I knew it'd come back around. It always does. Uh, you know, what do we lose with identity politics? And I think this is absolutely the question that, or the direction that you're headed. And I'll say one word. We lose unity. We forget the fact that, you know, as citizens, you know, we don't have to be pulled into all of these different directions. Like I say, we can. We have the freedom if we choose to, you know, coalesce, you know, we, you know, form a majority, try to convince, or if you're a minority, try to convince your neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens when, when we lose this unity? And that's where I think we, um, we really begin to tear, tear at the fabric of our nation. And yes, of course, we've had terrible grievances and terrible injustices, but how on earth can we begin to possibly overcome them when we're just categorized into these groups? We're taking what was in colonial America and because you were born into this, like you're suggesting, you know, just because you have a particular color of skin, you're going to be, you know, in that category there, so on and so forth. So, you know, uh, this is, this is the danger of identity politics, is it's just constantly, constantly dividing us and never giving us, you know, never even giving us a chance to catch our breath. And, you know, uh, again, I, another thing I teach is I teach political philosophy. So one of my favorite authors is um, Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville. And he talks about groups in a good sense. When he talks about associations, people learn. You know, think about when you were in student government, you practiced, you learned how to, you know, pray, you know have a consensus, have disagreements, so on and so forth. And it didn't matter the color of your skin or your socioeconomic background, et cetera. Um, the other author that I always, always, always have my student reads is Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Because the reason why Marx is so important is he always, he, he begins his Communist Manifesto by segregating everyone into a group or into groups, but it's always adversarial. And so when you pit Tocqueville, who's you know, trying to advance democratic institutions against Marx, who can never get beyond the adversarial um, interaction, that sets up the debate. I obviously come down on the side of Tocqueville, but that doesn't mean that I will ever let a class of mine ever go without reading Marx, because you have to read both. So, you know, I was actually glad when you didn't uh, um, identify any sort of um, political affiliation, because I consider it a failure if people walk out of the room and say, oh, I know how she's voting, or any of my students mm. think, oh, I know how she votes. Good heavens, if my students know that, then I am not doing a very good job. I'm advancing an agenda. I, and that's one of the reasons why I raise questions. That's how I teach. I want students to think, and I hope that you all think, and you know, can maybe pull back from this a little bit. I just want to say one more thing about you know the blacks. I grew up poor, and I mean, w we're talking poor. A mother who learned English in this country, and a mother who, um, you know, well, you know, public assistance so that we could eat, you know, through a fault of a man who was who didn't step up to the plate, like he should have, but. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I'm glad I grew up poor because <laughs> you learn resilience, you learn the ability to overcome what is set out before you, and I did my very best. I married a good man who provided well for his family, and I'll, I'll be eternally grateful, but you know what? You know what? I did everything I could to raise my children poor. Why? Because I wanted them to have the same <laughs> Go at it, get up, you know, pick up yourself by your bootstraps 
and make your own life. Now, hey, they had more clothes than I did. I sewed my own clothes. My daughter never did. But, you know, not all adversarial experiences are bad. So, uh, you know, discrimination is bad, but doggone it, then it fills you with a fire to say, I'm gonna overcome that. I mean, you know, I use the example of the LGBT community. You know, they saw a grievance. Now, whether we agree or disagree with the remedies, you know, I have no doubt that you know, we could take a vote and maybe we'd maybe it'd be 50-50, maybe it'd be 60-40, I don't know. But what that was an instance of when they could come together and, you know, debate, advance, d advance the discovery. Now we see the fraying, and I'm, I'm very interested to see what we see the fraying. So I'm going off into several different interests, so I'll stop here. So I'll say <laughs> a few things. Oh. One is that I've never met the person who would voluntarily subject themselves to racial discrimination in order to improve their own character. You know, maybe that person exists, but I have not met yeah, them. Yeah, John Howard Griffin. But, but, even, but setting that aside, all politics are by its very nature adversarial. I, I mean, that's why we have elections. If we, if we were capable of governing by consensus, we wouldn't need elections because we'd all agree what, 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 what to do and, and just do it. So politics by the, its very nature is about the fact that disagreements are inherent in a society and we need a mechanism to decide how to resolve the, those disagreements. That's what politics is for. And one thing that is inherent in politics is that people will organize amongst com along the lines of common grievances. So like, you know, imagine for example that there was some city ordinance here in Boulder that chain restaurants, restaurant franchise owners thought was holding them back. And they thought that they wanted to get this ordinance changed and they wanted to somehow, you know, impress upon the city council that it, that it should be changed. I am pretty certain that the way that the chain restaurants would handle this would not be to say all restaurants matter. I'm pretty certain that they would organize something like the American Franchi Franchise Restaurants Association. And they would unite around their common grievance as franchise restaurants in order to work together to solve the problem. And like that's just normal. That's how every p political dispute is handled. So if, if that is how we are comfortable with you know, franchise restaurants making their voices heard, and I don't know of any other way for them to do it, why do we think it's weird if, say, transgender people decide to organize along a common grievance that they all share in order to work together to, to find a political solution to that problem? You know, why would we think that it would be odd for people to organize, or organize along a racial line or, or a gender line? You know, it seems to me that it is very odd and not at all in the spirit of advancing a notion of equality to say that the restaurant franchises and you know, the National Organiz Association of Manufacturers and the AFL-CIO and anyone else who has any kind of common grievance is allowed to organize together around their common grievance. But if the, or, but if the grievance that you share is, well, this country has a history of discriminating against black people and it affects black people in common, so, we, so black people want to organize together to solve it, that they alone should be denied the opportunity to do what any other poli coherent political group is allowed to do. But they so, aren't. Well, question, does, do you think Black Lives Matter <coughs> speaks for all blacks? I, I think that it speaks for the people in that coalition. You, you know, again, people organize along along their common grievances. And so you have a large group of predominantly African-American people who decided to organize around a common grievance. I don't think they claim to speak for all, for all black people. I don't understand them, to, I don't understand anyone to be that arrogant. But I do think that um, they have a right, just like anyone else, to say that we are a group of people who share a common concern and we wish to organize together you know, in, in this case, organized together under, under, the, under a single name, under the Movement for Black Lives, um, in order to address that together. And I don't think what Black Lives Matter is doing is any different than what any other coherent interest group does. Yeah, okay, so, <laughs> you know, another one of the avenues I'm chasing down is what in the social science literature is called linked fate, which I was totally unaware of. It's not written about in the media anywhere, but it's very interesting 
especially applies to Hispanics, but rather than try and explain it, quick story. So, you know, I did teach for three years along with Bob Kaufman at Pepperdine, somewhat more conservative school than Boulder, right? And, you know, a religiously oriented school, right? So I had a number of black students, um, most of them religious, not all of them, some of them Republicans, and they loved Ronald Reagan. I couldn't tell them enough about Ronald Reagan. You know what else most of them liked? They liked Black Lives Matter. Uh, this is interesting, and so we have a really interesting conversation over coffee. And it turned out that they actually didn't like most of what Black Lives Matter did. They didn't like the protests and you know, blocking streets and certain other things that happened. So why do you like them? Well, it turned out that what they were telling me was, that's my, that's my tribe, right? And you know, we sort of stick together. They're, you know, we're all in this together. But the, I made up that point to say, uh, the difficulties I have and, and um, is uh, we, we try too much to say now that some, your specific thoughts or specific <coughs> attitudes should be determined by the group you're in, when I think there's actually quite a lot more variation. My black students at Berkeley have been fascinating. I'd love to tell the story about the kid I had whose father was a black panther. Oh my God, was he the most interesting kid in the class. Totally heterodox from any of the categories. Um, and I've had others like that. And so, you know, I don't know. My experience is limited. I just have a handful of anecdotes. Um, uh, but I think that one of the tendencies we have, and by the way, say, well, white, you know, white people all, you know, actually don't, right? Um, you know, seems to me. No, but I, I don't think, I, I have no problem if, if a group of transgender people want to come together and form a coalition and advance legislation or initiate a debate or, you know, question certain norms. That's fine. What I have a problem with is when they try to shut down the lesbians from advancing a position that's contrary to theirs. That's my problem. Let the lesbians speak. <laughs> That's what I want. I want the debate. I don't want, you know, oh, 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 you win. Oh, because you didn't win last time, but you win. No, no, no. So, I want the debate. So I, I want to define this term you're using about shutting down debate because, like, you know, we, we all have a right not to have the government come in and tell us we can't say anything. That's the First Amendment. But we don't have a right not to be socially ostracized. You know, we, we, we don't have a right not to be criticized. You know, if, if, if I have a group of friends and we want to go out and get Chinese food tonight and someone wants to invite themselves along who I just don't like for whatever idiosyncratic reason, I can exclude them from my outing to the Chinese restaurant and that's okay. And similarly, if you have a group of transgender activists and there is some other group of lesbians that for re whatever reason they do not want to associate with, they have a right to not associate with them. They have, they have, they have a right to criticize them. They, they, they have a right to you know, use very charged language when, when, they, when, when they criticize them. And I, and I don't know how you would build a politics where you, you can't do that. I, I, I mean, and that doesn't mean that sometimes some groups don't act in ways that are rude, that are unproductive, that are unstrategic, you know, that, that are counterproductive and wind up doing more to harm their, their cause that, that, than they advance. That, that, that does indeed happen, and it's, and it's unfortunate when a group that has a just objective uses unstrategic tactics. But I don't, well, let, let me just finish. Sorry, 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 I didn't mean yeah. Yeah. But I don't know how, like, you would create a rule whereby you say that you're not allowed to use tools such as criticism and social ostracization. That's a hard word to say. <laughs> um, you know, in any aspect of life, you know, whether political or non-political. So, uh, the, <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, I'm against rules too, but there is a climate of censoriousness about this subject. And I hope on Thursday, I have to leave Thursday afternoon, unfortunately. I have to be back at Berkeley on Friday all day. I hope you'll go hear Mark Lilla come talk about this subject. Mark Lilla is a board certified liberal Democrat and one of the premier intellectual historians of our time, I think, at Columbia. After the election, he said, you know, I don't think this identity politics works for us very well. He wrote that in an op-ed in that right wing rag, the New York Times. <laughs> Whereupon, he was called by one of his faculty colleagues a white supremacist and David Duke in academic robes. That's the response he got. I had him out to Berkeley. I thought, jeepers, this will be fun. And sure enough, he got called, he, he started off you know, making sure how much he detests Trump, how much he detests the Republican Party, still got called a white supremacist. 
that's the climate <coughs> we're in now. Yes, that's why I think this is destructive. Yes, yeah, so he, he was criticized. And, and I mean, I happen to disagree. That's criticism? I that's lunatic. I, I, I happen to disagree with that criticism. I, I mean, I think, that the okay. term, I think that the term white supremacy has a particular meaning, and that meaning doesn't align with what Mark Lilla said. I also think because that criticism is not particularly convincing, that it won't convince a lot of people. And, and, and that's fine. Oh. That, 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 that's, that's how debate works. But, but again, you are allowed to criticize people. You are allowed to criticize people in strong terms. And you are allowed to criticize people and sometimes be wrong. But it's not even really a criticism. There's like an argument there. It's just a, uh, uh, you know, a slur. I, I have another question from the, from the audience. No, 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 this is fine. But uh, I want to preface it with um, uh, a definition. I went to Wikipedia, which I do every once in a while. <coughs> so it must be true. So it must be true. And identity politics in common usage refers to an identity of, uh, a tendency of people sharing a particular racial, religious, ethnic, social, our cultural, cultural identity to form, these are the words, exclusive political alliances instead of engaging in traditional broad-based party politics are, are to promote their particular interests without regard to the interests of a larger political group. What that definition is underlining is that behind what we refer to as uh, 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 identity politics is an exclusivity and a uh, retreat from uh, <laughs> political alliances, a groupism. And the question, uh, you may or may not accept that as a definition, it seems to me that it's, it's uh, uh, pretty apt, but the, uh, uh, the question uh, which this definition leads into is, uh, is the, uh, uh, are, 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 is identity politics uh, destroying the Democratic Party? So I'm gonna That's the question. I, I'm going to reject the definition, and here's why. Like, let's pretend that race and gender and s sexual orientation didn't exist. Let's all pretend we're Chief Justice Roberts and we can't see it. And. <laughs> Then let's describe what the Democratic coalition is without referring to any of those categories. And you, you would say it's a coalition of labor unions. So it's a coalition mm. that involves environmentalists. It's a coalition that involves some people who are very affluent and may actually have personal interests that are not aligned with those of labor unions but who identify culturally, who are cultural liberals, who identify culturally with those values. You know, it, it is a coalition of people um, with many different views. And you'd say the same thing about the Republican Party. I mean, the, the, the classic description of the Republican Party, although this is less true than it used to be, is that it's a coalition of social conservatives, business, cons business conservatives, and um, at times it's been described as anti-communist, at times it's been described as like a more militaristic wing of the Republican Party. And there are interests there that don't necessarily align all the time, but they come together in coalitions because that's the only way that you can get a governing majority so you can do anything done. And so if we're willing to like think of ordinary like politics in terms of just people forming smaller coalitions around their common interests and then those various coalitions forming together in grand coalitions that are political parties, I don't see why it's different if you assume that some of the coalition partners that make up either the Democratic or the Republican Party are organized around a racial identity or are organized around you know, a, a desire to advance women's rights or organized around their, their, their sexual identity. You know, I, I just, I just don't, I don't, don't see how that's different. I, I think what all politics is is that People form together in relatively small coalitions based upon a common grievance, and then those coalitions form together to form parties. And some of those coalitions are along ethnic, gender, or sexual lines. Some of them aren't. You know, some of them are cross-cutting. So you know, you might have a per. You, you know, the, the term I'm, I'm I'm looking for here is intersectionality. You know, people have multiple identities. So you might have a person who is black. <coughs> 
and a member of the labor and, and a member of a labor union and is gay and also cares a whole lot about the environment and that's going to select them pretty hard into the democratic party but that's just how politics works is it, 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 is people organize around many identities and some of those identities are racial some you know some of those identities are i guess i would describe as inherent and some of those identities are like you know you're a member of a union or something like that but I don't see a meaningful distinction between the two of them on like any kind of moral line. Any comments on that? Well, I could. I don't. You know, I get a we have two. We in. have we have two minutes. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, well, well. you take one, and I'll take one. <laughs> um, I should say, by the way, that more than yeah, well, two people commented on the fact that. Uh, we have an all-white, uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, se seemingly, yeah, look, seemingly not terribly aggrieved. Uh, oh, uh, look, don't get me started on this. There were other people who recruited for this panel who dropped out because they were chicken shits. I don't want to get you. I, I don't want to. I definitely right. don't want to get you started on that. Well, you did, right? By the way, you mentioned labor unions. I've been thinking. You know, the. I'm sorry. I'm going to go on a rant here. Okay, go. Ian might even join. Where's the labor union? Go for it. This program at right. CWA. It's a labor union. A labor union organizer. Why is there nobody here from United Mine Workers or the United Auto Workers? CWA right? concentrated. CWA concentrated yeah. very effectively this year in making sure that over half of the panelists were women. Yeah, and but if we're you, all the same. Well, no, we're not, we're not the same. No, 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 no. Here's my point. Sorry, Albert. I'm going to cut you off here. We are all from elite backgrounds. All of us in this panel. We have different opinions. That's fine. We're all products of high education, high elite jobs. The genius of this program is we all pay our way to get here. So the only thing that's like it is those Renaissance weekend things that the Clintons used to go to. And so, you know, why not have a, where's the mayor of Beckley, West Virginia, who could talk about opioid problems? Or someone from a drug addiction clinic? So I'm sorry. I mean, I think this is a great program. But it's not diverse. That's a no. joke. I'm sorry, but it is. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not going to disagree with the criticism that there shouldn't be four white people on this particular panel. But I mean, yeah. I mean is the fact that, that I have a Mexican mother, does that, am I still white? <laughs> 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 I, I don't know. I guess I should start adding my, my maiden name. It's Cida Vaca, which is actually Cabeza de Vaca. And, you know, I, you know, you want me to do that? You know, I, I think that the people who, who put that oh. there, well, you know, are making assumptions, and maybe we should stop making assumptions. It's the same problem that I have with, with putting people into groups based on, you know, certain characteristics. It's like, you know, my, my skin color, making Wait, assumptions so about me. By the way, let me thank Ian for coming, because, uh, uh, you know, we had people cancel it. They're going to cancel this panel, and he agreed to come in at the last moment and do it. He's yeah, busy as heck, and, you know, you thank you. I think, panel, right? I think you all have done a wonderful canceled. job, and... We have to wind it up now, but uh, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Steve, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but you could have. No, 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 no. no.